You're listening to Lighthouse Conversations, brought to you by Lighthouse Haven, a spiritual home for your awakening soul. Lighthouse Conversations is a show where awakening souls gather to be inspired, connected, and enlightened. Spiritual spark plug and host, Chelly Canales, that's me, will guide you through the twists and turns of your journey to a safe haven where you are finally free to live your best light. Each episode contains a conversation with a guest who has gone through a spiritual awakening, detailing their unique and life-changing experiences in an intimate and candid way. Although everyone's experience is as unique as they are, we all share one common thread. We're all seeking something. So come join us on this journey and be prepared to leave with resources that will supercharge you into inspired action. Here's today's episode. Hello, 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 Awakening Souls. It's so great to connect with you again this week. I hope you're finding some time to get out in nature because fall, she is showing up. She's showing up and she's showing off and I absolutely love it. My walks have been such an interesting way to connect me with nature during the pandemic. Um, I've never walked so much in my life outside, miles and miles, you know, through the into spring and summer and fall and and you know just seeing the 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 light shift you know how how early it gets dark now and it's funny because I was always aware that these things happened um during you know the seasonal changes but it was usually when I was driving somewhere or meeting someone or going to some activity so you know through all of this through all the tough parts about the pandemic um there's also some really beautiful gifts and to me i just feel so much more connected to nature and and therefore connected to myself so i hope you're getting some time to enjoy the turning of the leaves and the crisp fall air so now that you've got your weather report uh for today i really am excited to share this interview uh that i'm going to share with you today with Bridget Dengel Gaspard. She is pretty fantastic. She wrote this amazing book called The Final Eighth. So if you feel, if you've ever been really dedicated towards a goal and you get seven of the eighth, you know, piece of the pie done and and when you get to that last piece to get it finished there's a stall that happens there's a self-sabotage or there's a fear or something when you just can't seem to get it done it's like you've everything's in place and you're very capable and you have all the right tools and yet there's a stall that happens and um there's a really amazing technique that uh, Bridget talks about in this interview and in her book um, where you dialogue with yourself. You have this incredible uh, way of talking to those various parts of you that are actually actively not dedicated to you reaching your goals. I found this super fascinating. I relate to it very much in my life. And I think that um, this is something a lot of people out there, you, you, my listeners at home, may have experienced as well. So um, I hope you enjoy this joyful conversation. And um, I'm just thinking about you and sending you love. And um, I look forward to connecting with you again next week. Oh, one thing before I go, um, I wanted to tell you there's going to be some ways to work with me online. Um, I have some programs coming out. One is based on my book, The ABCs of Awakening, a dictionary for the emerging soul, which I'm really thrilled about because there's a lot of people experiencing spiritual awakenings right now that don't necessarily have the tools or the resources or know where to begin. So this is kind of a welcome mat into this whole world of spirituality. Um, I can't wait to share it with you. And there's some coaching available. Uh, there's some online presentations I'm giving. I just can't wait to connect with you more. Um, yeah, so I'm just thankful you're here and I look forward to connecting with you more. Enjoy the episode. And welcome to the show, Bridget. How are you? Good. It's lovely to be here, Telly. It's so lovely to have you. And you're calling in from Brooklyn this morning. And I loved chatting with you about how I used to live in Brooklyn as well. And, you know, tell me about how, how things are in New York right now. Well, it's raining, it's pouring rain, and it's moving into fall, which is nice. But to be honest, the effects of COVID and I'm just not used to the streets being as empty as they are. And so it's nice to see people wearing their masks. But I think throughout the country, we've got the same struggles. Some people won't. And it's that part, I have to admit, is sad. Restaurants are closing. Retail is just disappearing, both mom and pop and massive big box stores. So um, the good news is I think neighbors are connecting more and we're all 
grateful for the smaller things. By that, I don't mean minor, but just, you know, stopping and really checking in when you run into someone on the street, that kind of thing. Yes, there's devastation and there are gifts. And so it's yeah. a matter of trying to focus on on the ones that I think uh, are meaningful, that extra connection and all of that, while still having a heart to observe all of the things that are changing and it's and it's so it's so difficult right now um i find nature to be so particularly healing during this time are you are you able to get to prospect park much at all oh i know that's your park that was um, my park <laughs> my park is brooklyn bridge park and oh, yes, yes it's yes. beautiful and we go most nights and the water that i mean it's the hudson i'm sorry the east river dropping down toward the Statue of Liberty and the currents are amazing. So you get a little bit of nature in this very urban area because the currents ebb and flow and the tide goes in and out. So if you think you're not connected to nature, it reminds you, yes, you are, you even are. though there's skyscrapers. <laughs> yes, I think I have a beautiful picture of me. Um, well, not because it's of me, but because of the skyline. <laughs> um, like playing a piano. I think they put up several years ago those pop-up pianos. Yes. And with the bridge in the background, um, just like a gorgeous skyline. So it, I love that you have that to to visit and and feel just inspired. It's true. I'd forgotten about the pop-up pianos. See, that's what I love about New York. It's like, wait, there's pop-up pianos? And it's like suddenly, and then I don't know if you were there for the pop-up big cows. No. Oh, actually, actually, maybe I was. That seems really familiar. All the painted, like the art. Yeah. Yeah. Love that. I, Who would have thought? Who would have thought? <laughs> that's what I love about humans. Like they think of things as big painted cows. And they're like, oh, <laughs> I didn't know I would like something like that, but I do. <laughs> but here we are, and it's a, it's a little gift. So I'm so thankful that you're here. Um, I have your book here right next to me called The Final Eighth, Enlist Your Inner Selves to Accomplish Your Goals. And when this book came to me, I was I felt that it was perfectly timed by the universe because I have been building this company of mine and, you know, the podcast and all these things. And it, it's like that finish line is so in sight. And granted, we never finish what we're doing. We're always growing. But there's like a leap that still needs to happen. And I'm seeing all of these sabotaging qualities within myself. And um, I'm really excited to talk to you about this book and the techniques that you use to help people through this. But I just want to hear your story. I want to hear how you came to be um, who you are today. So I too am a former performer. You probably are yeah. not a former performer. So I would say the long view and the short view answer to your question. I think that we all have an essence. I mean, that's obviously we do. And then what we do with that essence and how it unfolds depends on life circumstances and all kinds of things. But I would say that I've always loved moving and dance and been curious about people and dynamics. And my father was a performer. And so ultimately I became a performer and I was in a household that was around it, but I do think that it's the power of narrative and the unspoken dynamics that I really have always loved. And so that love, I would say, is with me now as I'm moving into this chapter of my life. But so as a performer, I was looking for creativity tools. At the same time, I was looking for personal healing um, for varying things in the family and I stumbled upon this book, which I recommend to your listeners even today. It's a classic, uh, Healing the Shame That Binds You. Yes, I know that. Tell me more. By John Bradshaw. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Have you read it? I believe I have. I think it's been a while, but yes, please continue. He has passed the author, but it's a classic that I would recommend to everyone. So at the end of this book was this section, maybe 100 pages, devoted to different I hate to use the word, but alternative healing modalities. Mm. And in that section, they he talked about voice dialogue. And it's developed by Hal and Sidra Stone, psychologists out in California. Uh, Sidra Stone is a Brooklynite from nice. born and bred. So it was just, it described voice dialogue, which is that you talk via different parts of yourself. You let different parts talk from their point of view. And it sounded amazing. And it literally electrified me just reading about it. And I was an improvisation person and comedy. And so it made sense that I would like that. 
also as an auditioner, what parts of yourself do you need to get into if you have to be a, a librarian turned mm-hmm. sexy mama? Right. But you are, you're able to do the librarian part, but you're kind of too shy to do the sexy mama part. Voice dialogue could help you get access to those parts of yourself. So it could be a literal creativity tool. And I hunted them down, which meant I called their 1-800 number. (laughs) And they became my mentors. And I started getting voice dialogue facilitations. And then I started getting trained in how to do it and ultimately how to teach it. And as I did this, I continued performing, but I watched the healing unfold in ways that were breathtaking and so quickly. And Mm -hmm. so that was a moment that synchronicity said, okay, you're going to, you think you're going for the healing of the shame, which by the way, it, it, the book was very helpful. And so is voice dialogue because the parts of you that have shame and are working to cover up injured, wounded parts, they have a place that they can be safe and communicate without being invalidated. So I think there's many consequences of voice dialogue that are just naturally healing. And so my interest shifted as the healing power just was undeniable all around me. And so ultimately pursuing acting and not getting the parts that I wanted was a whole lot less interesting than getting into the dynamic of voice dialogue and the healing. And so I went to school and got my master's from Columbia University. So I got clinical training so I could have really good clinical training and then experience aligned with my creativity tools in general, but voice dialogue in particular. And that has just changed my life. But did I know when I picked up that book how it would unfold? No, not at all. Although something made me willing to say, I'm in pain, let me see how I can get healed. And I think a lot of awakening journeys start with that pain and that this is pain to be honored. It doesn't feel good, but it's saying, hey, look, go get something. We don't have to be stuck in this original wounding or trauma that maybe came and it's got nobody's fault, but a house burnt down or something. Like it's not about the blame game. And that I want to share, I think, with your listeners is that the pain is a beautiful messenger. It's not warm and fuzzy, cuddly and loving, but it's 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 the, the tough love. Like, this is too painful. Go get something. Find something. You were yes anding your healing process. I love that. <laughs> yes. I, I, I've, been, I've done improv myself and, and I see like how important that is just for skills in life, going with the flow, not being stuck to your own agendas and not saying, you know, like I want things my way, this way, only this way. And that's when the pain comes, I think, yes. when we're so tied and so stuck to certain ideas instead of saying, why can't I maybe address this other part of myself, like you said, that I might not be comfortable with and go into a whole other area. Why not? Well, fear is is a, a big part of that. Um, but I, I agree with you in terms of the awakening. And I think so much of it is happening right now during these COVID times when people are forced to uh, look at themselves. The rug has been pulled out from under us. And so what do you do with that? And so that's... Um, I feel like there's not enough dialogue in in general mainstream culture about what are those like, okay, should we medicate that? Should we numb that? Like it just, you know, those are things that only delay, I think, the process. So you have learned these amazing tools and techniques that you can say work because this worked for you, right? Yes, Learning these absolutely. methods. Yes. So I wanna I wanna talk um a little bit more. Well, I actually want to go back to the arts just a bit because I truly feel the arts are a catalyst uh, for healing in many ways. I feel like when I'm most connected, I, I'm. it's through the arts. It's when I'm dancing. I'm channeling, you know, in, in a way. It's like the information. You, you're a vessel for things to come through. I want to hear about how performing and healing to you are, are linked. That is a beautiful question. I think... What pops up first is the permission. Performers have permission. And if you're an improv or comedy, you have permission to be anything because it's what you bring. If you're working with a script, whether it's musical theater or drama, you are a bit obligated to, uh, or more than a bit, um, (laughs) to the plot and to character development and that kind of thing. But still within that, you bring yourself. So, 
the inner permission to bring the parts of you And then, as you said, channeling is such an incredible feeling. And and no one can do it like you. It can be done well any number of ways. And again, if you it's hard when you're pursuing acting because it's like so much a zero sum game is how it's played. But in fact, as I was uh, in the field for a while, I began to realize, wow, there were like literally it's not false that there were five people that could have been picked because they were all amazing which is the way you, the director wanted to have that uh, character go. And so I think it's the ability to express a lot of people who don't have the arts. It's like you put down your day clothes and then you put on your creativity clothes, Mm. but a lot of people don't have that in their life. And even when they go to the gym, so they literally change clothes, it's still goal oriented. I was doing my goals all day at work and now I'm going to do my fitness goals, but it's not playing. That's it. And playing, that's part of the healing. It's like, if you're not playing, you're doing it wrong. How great is that? That you're breaking (laughs) the rules if you're not playing fully enough. A society does not give enough credit to playing and dreaming and, you know, those things, like you said, that are not goal oriented. But when you think about the greatest creations that have come to be, you have to think outside the box. You had to get a little bit playful in some degrees, you know, play outside of the lines, color outside of the lines. Um, And we... I think as a society say, well, I'm wasting time uh, doing that because it doesn't give me these check marks on my to-do list and and being done that way. Interesting. Okay. What do you think? Can I ask you? Like, what do you think is the relationship between healing and performing arts? That's a really, thank you. It's a question that's like really close to my heart. I think there's two, two ways about it. I think there's the healing that the audience receives by receiving your transmission of, of that light and that joy and that uh, commitment to being in the moment because it brings them into the moment as well. And they're able to see um, a story uh, from someone that they may not have known about before, and it provides this sense of empathy. And I think the arts are what saves the world. I think that's how we stay connected. And that's how, you know, we will continue to move forward is through story and, um, and gathering. Uh, I think for the artists, like you said, it's that permission thing. And, um, it's like when you're allowed to be outlandish or use your voice as big and and bold as you want to, that frees something in you. And, you know, for me, when I sing, you know, it's like something's unleashed and um, that it's like what what was the connection is clear. I, I think when it comes through the the inspiration coming from source kind of flows through and that's when I feel most connected and that's when I feel most at home. And I think it's particularly hard for artists right now. Of course, Broadway's is, is going to be out until mid next year. I mean, all of our local communities are just suffering so dearly. So it's not just like, yes, it's economically devastating. It's also devastating to the soul not to have that outlet. I'm sure you're, you've seen that around you in the neighborhood and things like that. Just like this sense of like joy might be missing. Absolutely. But you're, I don't know if you know this about Prospect Park. They're having pop-up performances. Have you read about that? that. No, I haven't. I'm so happy they are. Yeah. Comedians, all kinds of different performers, and then everyone's social distanced. Mm -hmm. And so, and I'm not sure it's a particular field in Prospect Park, which if it stays warm, I may go searching. Go I love it out. So I agree with you. It's devastating. But I also love how the revolutionary need to move, keep that creativity and healing going still is got it's, you know, popping up and, and it's very inspiring. Oh, it's so is. I'm so glad to hear that. You'll have to tell me how it is if you if you do get to go. <laughs> That's great. We're just like, please let it be warm for a few more months. <laughs> warm yes. enough to be outside. Yes. Well, I want to talk about your book, The Final Eighth. Um, It seems like this work has been a part of your life for so long. How did the book come to be? So the book is, the tool that I use throughout the book is voice dialogue. And I guide readers step by step. So whoever's listening, if I say something complicated, don't worry, it really is a step by step how to talk to the different parts of you. And so then I after I went to school and worked for a few years in the field, I went and started my own private practice, which was my plan. It was actually one of the only plans that I had a ladder planned out. And then the ladder took me straight to the private practice, which is what I wanted. 
So it can work sometimes. You just, as you said earlier, it's the attachment. If it doesn't work, I would have figured something else out. Right. But in my private practice, I saw a variety of folks, people in the creative field, lawyers, bankers, and the term, the final eighth popped out of me. I began to see this phenomenon of dedicated, talented, hardworking, totally uh, resource resourced. You know, they had the education and the resources and they would stop in sight of their finish line. And I knew they were telling the truth, like they really were working that hard because I've been with them for the year. And that's when it popped out. I'm like, this is the final eighth. The idea being that people who were amazing had done seven eighths of the work. And then I started, this is several years ago, and I started to explain it. I'm like, well, I'm kind of conceiving this as like the final eighth. And it was a mystery. I didn't know why they were stopping and they didn't either. And they were frustrated. And I was frustrated in the sense like I don't know quite how to help because it's it doesn't make logical sense. But then when I explained it as a final eighth, everyone took to it immediately and they would come in. Oh, it's a final eighth issue. And over time, I began to realize since I think about parts healthy personality consists of many selves. And I say that because it's not disassociative identity disorder, which is a trauma related mental health disorder. And so healthy people are just a amalgam of inner selves. I call them subpersonalities, alter egos, personas, and that that's normal. And so, but I began to realize that the selves that had gotten the person seven eighths of the way there believed in them, believed in the goal, and had the skills. Then there were many different reasons why they were stopped by another batch of cells. And I call that the double bind. They literally were halted. And so usually people double down on what their usual strengths are. I'm going to work harder, or I'm going to call more connections. or And there's nothing wrong with those, but that's not the problem. The problem in that case is much deeper. And so often the doubling down on the skills that you're used to using is an avoidance technique. But we don't see it that way because it's very wonderful behavior, which on its own it is. But if it's not the problem, thus it's not the solution. So the other parts usually are parts of ourselves we're not so comfortable with for a variety of reasons. And some of them, it's the the client maybe didn't want to feel like a beginner. I've got to go learn some new skills. And, And you have to have the distress tolerance to be a beginner in certain areas. But others, I found, were still attached to the core negative beliefs that they had been told that they were in their childhood. Right. And they're so painful. I believe there's only one or two and everything falls in. I'm not lovable. I'm worthless. I mean, they're awful. And wildly, you think, well, why would anybody or any part of ourselves hold on to such painful false beliefs? They were never true, but it was true. You believed them and made decisions accordingly and now have to deal with that. But it's actually a distorted loyalty. As kids, we want our parents to be happy and we love them. So if we get the message life doesn't work out or money is evil, then those parts are like, no, I don't want to betray my early caregivers because those parts are usually very young. And so in the process, we love those parts and we're like, yes, you can always love them. But you know what? You had some misinformation and and we're going to just let you know that. And usually those parts are very young, you know, a few months old to just a few years old. And paradoxically, for those people that are stuck in that way, when you bring those parts in and love them, the double bind melts. And it's not about working harder. It's about letting, let loving those parts that were basically distorted. Wow. Yes. Um, I recognize so much of that and understand, you know, what it means to get those messages early in life and spend a lifetime trying to dismantle them or even recognize them, you know, and, and it's less dismantling them. It seems like more, like you said, just loving, loving them and understanding, um, you know, you might not have gotten the best information and that's okay. And that doesn't make anybody wrong or bad. It's just at the time that was the best information. Um, and, you talk a little bit about, you know, there are parts of us that 
it's, it can also be helpful in a way, right? If you have those sides of you that maybe you don't necessarily want to acknowledge, but there's a positive spin that you can find for those, those pieces of yourself as well. Can you tell me more about that? Yeah. So every single self has the noble purpose of protection in terms yes. of the voice dialogue model, period. So, uh, so the things that have to be gotten rid of is toxic behavior or allegiance to lies like you're not good enough. And those can be done gently. There, it's not about, you know, uh, I don't know, just oppress that belief. There's a lot of, to me, military terms in the self-help world, you know, just get rid of it. And it's like, well, <laughs> I've got some other ideas because A, it doesn't work. I don't find it works. If it worked, actually, I'd, I'd be totally for it. Like, let's get the armies and boot <laughs> that into critic, but it doesn't work. So, so then you find out what's the gift, even of a very, um, I don't know, a revengeful self, an envious self, these selves that we wish we didn't have. We call those hidden selves. And often they are hidden from us. We're totally unconscious of them. But often we know they're there. We just wish they weren't and we will hide the fact to others that they're there. And so like the idea is that they have gifts. So if they're in pain and force you, I put that in quotes, to pay attention, that's a gift. Mm, it's like they're yeah. trying to tell you working harder is not the answer. And often those selves will only turn up the volume because you're not listening. If you start to listen, they don't need to throw a fit. <laughs> they can just, you can feel it in your stomach. They all live in our body. That's one of the questions we ask when we talk to yourself, where are you in uh, like, where are you in the body? What is your belief? What's your opinion about the goal? Then we find out literally, well, I don't want that goal for this reason. Now, the reason is usually a very good reason. Now that you know that that's an underground reason, then you can deal with it directly. Is it accurate? Do you need more child care before you can grow your business that you can trust because there's a part of you that doesn't want to admit that it's not quite working as it is right now, mm -hmm. that kind of stuff, then, then the focus might be on improving your support at home, ironically, not how to move into that Fortune 500 in the way you thought. So that's another gift. It often helps reveal and then release the block that's happening. Wow. So when you see these transformations occur, like what shifts do you see? Like what big differences do you notice in people once they kind of go through that process and the aha moment comes? One is I just and I know you know this feeling like the pleasure of watching someone's world be rocked. Like, yes. Oh, because the other thing that happens with the final eighth and that gridlock is that you somewhere are not ready for your transformation. It is indeed a new identity. So if you are always a contender and a nice one at that and very responsible, but you really don't own that you're a victor. Even though technically and logically you think, well, that's ridiculous. That shouldn't be a problem. It is. So part of what the aha is people going, I'm much more than I thought I was. It's a literal transformation. And sometimes vertigo happens Wow. on a regular basis. So much so I've come to realize, and as a dancer, I'd love to hear your thoughts. It's because your center has changed yes. because you thought you were this big. Now you're that big. And the center had to go, oh, it doesn't last long, but I have seen the vertigo happen regularly and I've experienced it myself. And so often after a session, I'll say things like drink a lot of water, do hold the handrails because you are in a slightly altered state, just like you would be after a deep massage. It's not more mysterious than that, sure. but it is an altered state because you're altering because you want to be because that's transformation. It's disorienting to suddenly be expanded. And I, and I think of it like a glass container that your soul's in and then it, it shatters and it gives you this, um, new, new way of like, you have to take up more space now with your soul, your presence, your being, your essence. And that is something that people, wow. I, at least for me anyway, it, it, it can make you feel so uncertain and, and for a moment, but like you said, you get used to it. You, you're, this is your new reality and you go from there. Um, that's, that's so cool. I, you've been helping people, you know, one-on-one -on -one, and now you get to help people all over the world with this book. Um, 
if there's one message you wanted to, you know, share with our listeners about this book and about this process of, you know, getting there almost and getting stuck, what would you like to say? Overall, be curious instead of, and, and honor that you're frustrated or angry or whatever those difficult emotions are, but be curious about them. And in the book, I offer different ways to look at things. I wanted to write a book that didn't have information that you could get from other people. I'm an author and self-help lover. So I didn't want to repeat the terrific wisdom that is out there. So in this book, I feel like I deliberately help people turn things upside down to look in a new way, like the gift of a difficult self. And so there's a lot of active paradoxes that we enter through different exercises because I'm assuming you've worked hard. I'm assuming you've had a lot of help. I'm assuming you've even had some transformational experiences. So my book says, great, let's start where you are. We're not throwing any of that away, but something isn't working and it's not the usual thing or else you would just do it. Right. And I'm a proponent of just do it. Let's we'll try that first. <laughs> <laughs> you just, yes, try these exercises. Like I'm always a fan of, I've never thought of it this way before. This information is new to me. Um, cause I know I tend to be one of those people who will get really excited about certain exercises, but I'm like, Oh, I think I've done something like this before. Uh, I don't know that I necessarily want to do all that again. Although I do think it would be helpful, but in that moment I just right. get like, I'm not sure. So there's something absolutely to be said for like this, like, give your system something new to process here. This is, this is great. Um, and do you have, you know, presence online in terms of, uh, where you go through some of these techniques and people can kind of see it happen for themselves? Yes. So every third Thursday of the month is a free virtual voice dialogue Ooh. workshop. Yes. And just contact me directly, and I give the Zoom information. You are so welcome to come, Chelly. I would have Any of your listeners. Okay, good. <laughs> and it's at 8 p.m. Eastern. Okay. And we, my co colleague, Eric Potempa, and I do two basic sessions, very short voice dialogue sessions, because it's just so much easier to see. And that helps any reader just... Because they're like, oh, okay, so when I move over to a self, because you do move to a different part of the room as a self. So that's one way. And uh, newsflash, I think we're going to change it starting 2021. So you're the first to hear. Oh, to breaking news. <laughs> Woohoo, eight and eight. So we're going to move from third Thursdays to 8 p.m. on the 8th of whatever month. Because those that couldn't make it on Thursdays would never have a chance. Right. So if we just do eight at eight. First, everyone has to remember. That's easy to remember. Easy to remember. And so if like Wednesday nights aren't available one month, the day you are available, you can do it. So I plan to do that every into the foreseeable future. That's a one way to come in. And then I will be offering final eighth companion workshops because how do you to so support? So as you go through these aha moments and the transformation, we I'll help you not revert back. And so that uh, you can really enter this new life actively. So the book itself will be helpful. But for those that feel themselves slipping back into the uh, usual, the familiar, which is completely normal, uh, I want to help, con you know, be a little of the gravitational force toward the final eighth and not back into the seven eighths. I love that. I think that we need each other. And the whole point of, of, you know, having people in roles to help others is because we do sometimes need that extra little push. And there is a lot we can do on our own, but we also need each other. Um, and we'll put the information in the show notes in terms of your website so they can get signed up and, and get all that information. Um, before we go, I have one last question. What was your final eighth moment in, in life? Oh, well, First of all, if, if we're lucky, we end up after our final eighth having a first eighth. Uh -huh. And so enjoy that because sometimes the final eighth block is really not knowing what to do with the next eighth, the first eighth. So I feel like I'm blessed that I've had many, but uh -huh. I talk about in the book, the final eighth of finishing the book, because I used to joke for years, well, I'm uh, working on finishing my book on not finishing. <laughs> that, I couldn't use that joke anymore once I finished it. But what happened, and it was a surprise, is it was a quiet, blissful moment. Like, literally, I finished the book, 
that didn't mean I, it was before I had a publisher and that there wasn't more work to do, but I worked on it for years and it was in February, 2019. And I realized I'm done. I've got nothing more to say. And it was wild, but it was so quiet. And that surprised me. That reminds me of a Sondheim song. I believe, is it Sondheim? No, wait. It's a song called A Quiet Thing. And I believe it's from, so I don't think it's Sondheim, but Floor of the Red Menace. It's like when it all comes true, um, you know, just the way you planned. It's funny, but the bells don't ring. It's a quiet thing. And I used to love singing that song. Now I have to look this up because I'm, I will be a really bad musical theater person if (laughs) I say this wrong. Yes. But it's about how everything, there's all this buildup to like, I want to get this thing done. Um, and, and, and I think when I finally achieve it, it's going to be this like fireworks. It's going to be, um, you know, this, this massive moment that, you know, everyone's going to throw me a big party and champagne, but there's something about that quiet, that quiet moment where it's like, Oh, I guess this is it. Um, yes. I can't believe I said, um, Sondheim, I'm totally fired from musical theater. It's obviously candor and ebb. And, (laughs) Fired from musical theater, and and oh, it, I remember God. it was Liza Minnelli uh, who who was um, who sang that, and so yeah, listen to that. I wonder if those those lyrics will um, resonate with you about that moment. As oh, well. I will. I'm going to listen to it today. <laughs> but that's exactly right. Uh, that song I think describes. I expected fireworks, and I wasn't at all unhappy when I got that quiet, thick f- fullness. It was not like a consolation prize. It just was a surprise. Oh, I love that. Oh, well, thank you for this. This has been so delightful speaking with you. I think your work is so important. And I really, excuse me, I encourage everyone to get out there, get the book, The Final Eighth, learn more about your work and join you online for some amazing facilitation. So thank you, Bridget. This has been thank you. Such a pleasure. Thank you for listening to Lighthouse Conversations. If this show resonates with you, it would mean so much to have you rate, review, and share. Don't forget to follow us at ChelliCanales.com and on social media.